and record. All right, so, all right, so we have unit three where we're focused on focusing on making inferences um, based upon our, on our population based upon samples, information that we we get from samples. So we want to first start out by with unit seven where we looked at survey sampling, how to get good samples. We talked about uh, different biases within our sample, accuracy, precision, the difference between statistics, parameters. Um, so a lot of different things that we want to use um, or, or know so that we can be able to make these inferences about the population. So um, for those that are entering, please make sure you enter with your first and last name so that we could uh, take attendance on the learning comments can get information out to you. Right. So a um, couple of things that you need to know, I mentioned a few of them, definitely that central limit theorem, um, how to calculate probabilities, confidence intervals with and without a calculator, right? Because there might be some things that you need to do, like find the margin of error, right? So I, I've tried to just minimize it because I only have one hour with you. So I'm going to just kind of hit on some of the basic things to try to make sure we can make it through all three chapters of uh, the of the unit three test. All right, and best wishes on your final exams for next week as well. So one of the things that we want to make sure we have a good understanding of is our definitions and the symbols. The differences between our statistics, um, you have your sample mean, so that's the mean of a sample, that's your X bar. Your, your statistics estimates your parameters. Remember statistics, that's based upon my sample, so that's information that I know. But parameters, those are typically unknown. I don't usually know them because they're based on populations. So we want to make sure we understand that the sample mean estimates the population mean. So that's X bar and mu. Sample center deviation estimates sigma. Sample variance estimates populate, population variance. And your sample proportion P hat estimates population proportion. So being that statistics all of these statistics estimate their parameters. So that's why we also call statistics estimators as well. So if I give you the information, you have all daily maximum temperatures in August last year for all US cities were recorded, then the mean of all of the maximum temperatures would be what? So because I'm saying that we have this information for all, then the mean all all the US cities, that's my population of interest. So since this is a population of interest, then any numerical value that I calculate on the population would be a parameter, okay? So the mean of all of those temperatures would be a parameter, and that would be my mu, the mean of all the temperatures, okay? So, Feel free to uh, raise your hand, ask questions at any point as we go through these examples. I'm just going to keep it moving again to try to make sure that we can get through everything in a timely manner where we're not rushing the content. All right, this should be a review, so I'm not trying to really teach everything in depth here. All right, so accuracy and precision. We talked about how accuracy is you're, you're trying to determine where's my center. You know, if I'm pretty accurate when I'm playing, you know, bullseyes, then 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 I'm, I'm getting, I want the dart to hit the center of the bullseye. That's the goal. So when I'm able to do that, then I'm accurate. So we say that any time that we can take the average of all of our sample proportions, that should be the same as our population proportion. When this happens, that lets me know, man, we're pretty darn accurate here. Okay. Now, so it's a measure of our center. We're trying to figure out where is the center of my, my data located, okay? Now, precision is measured by looking at your spread. So it kind of takes us back when we did socks, shape, outlier, center, spread. So when we're dealing with the spread or the variation, then I'm talking about precision. Well, if my variation is low, that means I'm not very consistent. So as I keep taking samples over and over again, or in this case, as I, I'm, I'm shooting, you know, throwing these darts at the wall, I'm all over the place. 
And if I'm all over the place, not very consistent, looking at this one, not very consistent here. My variation is high. So because I have a high variation, then I have a low precision, okay? Not, not very precise because I'm not consistent. We're on over here, I, I am very precise because I consistently threw it in the same area. Now I'm not accurate because I didn't get it in the bullseye, but I was precise, okay? So precision, again, as we discuss, we wanna think about our variation when we're talking about precision. Accuracy, we're talking about our center, right? Did we do a very good job at calculator of figuring out where's the center of my, my distribution, okay? Sampling distributions. A sampling distribution says, hey, I wanna take many samples of the same sample size from the same population. So for example, I'll take one sample and with that one sample, I may calculate the, the average, um, we're just, this is chapter seven, so I will just say proportion. So if I'm, if I'm trying to calculate the sample proportion, then I'm calculating a P hat. So after I take that one sample from the population and I calculate my, my P hat, which is my statistic based upon the sample. And then let's say that that P hat is about, let's say 31%. So 31% of students love the color blue. And then I go and take another sample from that population. It has to be the same sample size, right? So it, we, we can't take different sample sizes, same sample size. So then let's say I, I calculate the, the percent that like the color blue and this time I get 29%. Then I do it again. And let's say this time I got 30%. Do it again and I get maybe 33%. Well, the differences between those values represents my precision, okay? Because that determines my spread. The difference between from one statistic to the other, that variation, that measures how precise I am. If I was very consistent, you see that most of my numbers are about the same, practically the same values, then that lets me know that I was very precise. My variation should be low and that increases my precision, all right? So when you take just one sample, however, that's something that you did in you know chapter one, you dealt with one sample, maybe in chapter four, you dealt with just one sample. And then I said, hey, make a histogram. So when you did that based upon just one sample, that's called a distribution of a sample. That's not the same as a sampling distribution because that's just one sample versus many, many, many samples. All right, so everything that we're doing in this unit is based upon sampling distributions. So one of the key things that you had to learn was how to determine whether your sampling distribution was, if it followed a normal distribution or not. So we had to check the conditions. So when we're dealing with sample proportions, the central limit theorem or the CLT for sample, for sample proportions says one, you, you need to make sure that your selection was both random and independent. We said that we would love to have a simple random sample, but if it's not a simple random sample, as long as the, the problem tells us it was a random selection and, and their independent events were good. We need a large enough sample. And in this case, a, a proportion question, the survey question is yes or no. So for example, like I, I just said, hey, do you like the color blue? If that's the survey question, your answer is yes or no. There is no data to enter into your calculator. All we do is count how many yeses and noes. So in that case, we need at least 10 people to say yes and 10 people to say no. And if that, if we have that, then we have a large enough sample, okay? And then the large population test. Now on your, on your unit three test, when you're checking conditions, that's exactly how we'll be asking you, did it pass the large sample test? Were the conditions met for that? Did it, were the conditions met for the large population test? And you would say yes or no, or met or not met, okay? Now the large population test says your population size needs to be 10 times larger than your sample size. So if you got 30 people in your sample, then you need to have at least 300 people in your population in order for your population size to be large enough, okay? So the very first thing you're going to do 
in your in your problems on your test, you got to determine is this a proportions question or is this a means question? If the question, if you see percentages, then mm, that's that kind of lets you know it's proportions. But to it, to make to make sure that that's what it is, then you have to just think to yourself, well, what was the question that was asked on the survey? And if that question gives you only two options, you know it's a proportions question. If it's yes or no, true or false type things, that's a proportion. All right, so if I'm ever telling you, hey, 10 out of 50 people said they support such and such, you know that's proportions because either you support it or you don't. All right, so once those conditions have been met, then these are two conclusions, well, three conclusions that you can, that you can draw. The first conclusion is, now your sampling distribution is normal. That's the first conclusion you will draw once those conditions have been met. Now we need it to be normal so we can calculate probabilities and, and, and calculate confidence intervals and hypothesis tests, right? Also, once those conditions have been met, then the mean of all of your sample proportions that you calculated when like all those different P hats that I was calculating when you're doing, when we're doing our sampling distribution, the mean of them, that will always e equal my population proportion. So that's where we get mu of P hat equals P. The mean of all the sample proportion will always equal my population proportion, okay? When we see that, that means that our P hat is unbiased. It's an unbiased estimator. So in other words, did a very good job in, in estimating our, our parameter here, okay? So whenever you see something talking about as being unbiased, this is what, it, what, what we're explaining, okay? Now, if your sample size increases, well, well, let me introduce this first. This is our standard error for proportions. Remember that standard error is simply the standard deviation of a sampling distribution. Okay. So we call it sigma of p hat, the standard deviation of your sampling distribution. Okay. So as my sample size increases, my standard error decreases. You don't believe me, plug in some values into that formula. So sample size increases, standard error decreases, which does what? When my standard error decreases, that's decreasing my variation. And if my variation decreases, what happens to my precision? It improves. Okay, very important concept. Precision improves as sample size gets larger. That's because your standard error is getting smaller. Right? So these are the three main conclusions that you're going to draw after you have proven the conditions have been met by the central limit theorem. Your sampling distribution is approximately normal. Mu of p hat is equal to p, and our standard deviation converts to standard error. So it's something you would have to calculate. That's nothing that's given to you in your... Um, your calculator, you must calculate standard error. All right, so that takes us to calculating probabilities of sampling distributions. Once you check those conditions, now for what we're going to do for the sake of time is we're gonna assume all conditions have been met. Every problem that I selected, all conditions have been met. All right, so based upon that, then let's go ahead and, and calculate the probability. So we have Skittles, 20% of Skittles are red. So that is a population proportion because I'm saying 20% of all of them are red. So that's a P, population proportion is 20%. Now remember, you must convert percentages to decimals because you can't enter the percent into your calculator, it has to be a decimal. If we take a random sample of 100 Skittles, that's my sample size, 100 Skittles from a day's production, What's the probability that the proportion in our sample, proportion in our sample, that's a P hat, that sample proportion, will be less than 20%. So the question is saying, what's the probability P hat is less than 20%? Okay. All right, 
So whenever you're being asked to calculate probabilities, you're going to use a normal CDF. Now this is probabilities of, of uh, proportions now, sample proportions. So you're going to enter in your minimum P hat, maximum P hat, P and standard error. So a lot of this information is given in the problem. You're looking for P to be less than 20%. Now, once you checked all conditions, then remember mu of P hat is the same as your P. So mu of P hat is the center of your sampling distribution. So it's going to be the same as P, and P in this case is 0.2. So now my sampling distribution has a center of 0.2. Now we need to calculate standard error. All right, remember the three conditions. The first one, hey, sampling distribution is approximately normal. The center will be the same as the parameter. And we calculate standard error by using the, full, well, I gave you the formula in the previous slide, so let me just go ahead and use it. So it's P, your P is 0.2 times one minus P. So one minus P is 0.8 and you divide that by your sample size, which in this case is 100. All right, plug that into, oh, thought I grabbed my calculator and I grabbed the phone, grabbed the wrong thing. All right, so we're gonna plug that into our calculators to determine that standard error. And I calculated at 0.04. All right, so if you are have, well, you will have to do this. So when you have to choose the correct graph, then you must remember that you're in standard error now, not standard deviation anymore. So you're gonna add and subtract 0 0.04. So that next number should be, oops, did the wrong thing there. 0.24, then 0.28, because we're adding 0 0.04. And then to the left of the center, subtract 0 0.04 and keep subtracting it. You know, that's just putting all of our values in uh, one standard deviation away, two standard deviations away, et cetera. All right, so we're interested in, I don't think I meant to use 20%. Yeah, I didn't mean to do that. Let's change that to, because less than 20% is simple because my center is at 20%. So that would just be 50%. Uh, so let's do less than, let's say 15%. Okay, so change this. Yeah, made a boo-boo there. All right, so since I want less than 15%, so that's somewhere over here, and we would shade to the left for less than. So then our minimum p-value, we're looking for the minimum, the graph, remember, goes on indefinitely. So the minimum value of interest will be negative infinity. Okay, so we said we can use negative 99 for negative infinity. And then our maximum p-value would be the 15%, the so 0.15. Then our p is 0.2, 20%. And then our standard error we calculated at 0 0.04. So let's switch over to the calculator. And let's enter that in. So our normal CDF is under distributions, number two. So our lower was negative infinity, so we can leave the negative one e to the 99, that's, that's fine for negative infinity. The upper was 15%, and then our p was at 20%. Remember, your calculator is not going to change mu to p, but you know, just enter it in the order as stated. And then our standard error was 0 0.04. Uh-oh, <laughs> put that in the wrong place. Let's try that again. Right, about 11%. It's about 11% probability 
that if you have 20% of all Skittles are red, that if you were to take a randomly select 100 of them, there's about 11% chance that less than 15% of them would be red. All right, any questions on calculating probabilities? Yes, um, how did you get 0.8 for the equation? 0 0.8, 0 0.8. I don't really- Back like where the work was, it was, um, I think 0.2 times- Okay, so your formula, yeah. your standard error formula is P times its complement. So if P is 0.2, then the complement is 0.8. Okay. One minus P. All right, thank you. You're welcome. All right. Okay. So now, let's take a look at confidence intervals for means. Oops. All right, so here is your formula by hand. You need to know how to do it by hand as well as by the calculator. Um, a confidence interval for, I think I said means, but I meant proportions. The basic formula, it says, take your statistic and add and subtract your margin of error. Well, when you're dealing with um, proportions, your margin of, this is your margin of error. Margin of error is your critical value, which is a z-score, um, times your standard error of your estimate, your estimated standard error, because confidence intervals, we don't know P, we're looking for them, okay? So therefore, uh, here is your formula by hand, and then we'll do it in the calculator as well. So it says, we have a random sample of 2,000 adult Americans were surveyed, so that's our sample size. 15% of them said they believed in aliens. So 15% of my sample, so that's my P hat, sample proportion. Find the 95% confidence interval for the proportion of Americans who believe in aliens and then interpret that interval. So if I had to do this by hand using my formula above, my P hat is at 15% and I would add and subtract my critical value of Z. Well, I need to figure out what that is. At 95%, this is how you calculate your critical value of Z. You're gonna use inverse norm one plus your confidence level divided by two, where your confidence level is 95%. Now, this is the one that I've always said to my students that this is the one you want to just remember. The critical value of Z, and if you look at my PowerPoints, I gave you a, a chart where it has this, it has a bunch of critical values on there for you. So the critical value of Z at 95%, if you plug this into your calculator, you're gonna get a 1.96 using inverse norm. Okay, so that's one you may want to remember. Okay, so the critical value is 1.96, that's your Z. And then you're going to multiply that by your standard error, which is going to be your P hat, 15%, one minus the P hat, that would be 85%. And then divide that by N, which is your sample size. So now that's how we would do it by hand. I'll leave you all to do that calculation. Let's flip over to our, our calculator for the sake of time so that I can show you how to, you know, remind you rather how to do this in your calculator. Well, when you are dealing with confidence intervals for proportions, then you want to use a one prop Z interval. Okay, one sample proportions, Z is my test statistic and you're doing a confidence interval. Okay, so switching over to the calculator, that's stat, test, and if you go to letter A, scroll down or just go alpha A, it takes you to your one prop Z interval. It asks you for X, X is the number of successes. That's the number of people who said yes. Now in this problem, it said we had a sample of 2,000 and 15% said they believed in aliens. So 15% of 2,000, you can do that calculation right here. 15% converted to a decimal times 2,000. There you go, that's 300 people. So 
n is your your sample size that was 2000 and then our confidence level was 95 percent so if you would have used that formula that we did by hand added and subtracted those numbers this is what you would have calculated okay. now part b of that problem says well is it plausible that more than 10 percent of americans believe in aliens well, if you look at this interval and you interpret it, you would say we are 95% confident that between, we'll say that's 13.4% and 16.6% .6 of Americans believe in aliens. So if we're 95% confident it's between those two numbers, then yes, it is plausible that it's more than 10% because this entire interval is above 10%. Right, any questions on confidence interval? Yeah, right. can you do the calculations for that again? Uh, well, there's only three things that you would enter. Okay. You're entering your X, which is your number of successes. How many people said yes? So we calculated that in the problem. It said that we had 2000 people and 15% said yes. So 15% of 2,000 is 300. And then it asks you for N, your number of successes, I'm sorry, your sample size, and it asks you for your confidence level. So there's only three things that you have to enter in there. And your confidence level was at 95%, so 0.95. And just hit calculate. There were um, a, a couple questions that didn't specify the exact confidence interval percentage, but we were trying to figure out um, the, what is it, the, Z, the margin of error, the, like 95% is 1.96, but it didn't give us 95%. Is there like a standard confidence confidence interval? Okay, what, what problem did not give you 95? That is the standard, but what problem? Uh, I, it was in... I'm, I don't really remember. I know it was in uh, one of the uh, one of the uh, assignments as, that we okay. were working through this week. Okay. Yes. Um, Ninety-five percent is the standard confidence level. Okay. Just like when we get to hypothesis test, alpha is your your five percent alpha is your standard your standard significance level. Thank you. Can you explain? I'm sorry. Sorry. Can you explain the um, like more how the critical value um, just kind of equals 1.96 you okay. were talking about early, earlier. All right, so the critical value is calculated by this formula, inverse norm, one plus your confidence level divided by two. Your confidence level is 95% in this problem. So one plus 95% is just 1.95. So if you go to your inverse norm function and you plug this in, now remember you're calculating a z-score. So when you're calculating z-scores, remember that converts your distribution, your normal distribution to a standard normal distribution. So when you're in a standard normal distribution, remember that your mu is zero and your sigma is one. That's something that we covered in chapter six. So anytime you're calculating critical values for Z, you're converting to a standard normal, any Z, whether it's you've learned Z scores since unit one, you did Z scores in unit two again, and now we're doing them again. They just have a different name now. We call it the test statistic. Okay, so when you plug in your 1.95 divided by two, if you're in math print mode, as I am here, if you're not in math print mode, then you would just plug inverse norm and, and put that value behind it and press enter. All right, so you see I have my mu of zero and sigma of one, and then just hit paste. And there's your 1.96. And if you recall, we're at a 95% confidence level. And what do we know about 95% of our data? Doesn't 95% of our data lie within two standard deviations of the mean. Isn't that what that's telling us? Instead of saying two standard deviations, that's an approximation of 1.96. Okay. 
All right. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, chapter eight, hypothesis testing. What do we need to know? We need to know how to write your hypotheses, the null and the alternative. Calculate your Z statistics. We just calculated the um, critical value for Z. Now we're gonna calculate the test statistic for Z using another formula. You wanna calculate p-values, you wanna interpret them. You need to be able to determine if you're gonna reject or fail to reject the null hypothesis. And then you wanna conduct hypothesis testing for one, uh, sample proportions, two, if you're, if you're in some classes. Um, not all classes cover the two. Um, on, all online classes do cover two sample proportions, um, but not every uh, in-person class covers the, the two sample proportions. So just if you had to do section eight, four, then you're gonna have to do the two sample proportions and then be able to do type one and type two errors. All right, so how do we write hypotheses? Your null hypothesis, that's your status quo. It will always contain an equal sign. Your alternative hypothesis is your research hypothesis. It will never contain an equal sign. So chapter eight is still about proportions. So you always, always include parameters in your hypotheses. You do not plug in statistics. So I should never see a P hat or an X bar I mean, you shouldn't have an S and standard deviation then go into hypotheses. Um, you should only have mu's and p's for population mean and population uh, proportion. All right, so that's the key. Always contains and never contains, okay? Always contains an equal sign for the null. Now, what's my test statistic? Here's the formula for the test statistic. When you calculate your test statistic, you can do it by hand or you can use your calculator, which I'll show you shortly. Your test statistic, in this case, your Z statistic, anytime, which we talked about back in unit one, anytime you have a test statistic that lies outside of two standard deviations away from your mean, that's considered unusual. So anytime we have something that's unusual, that's something we do not expect to happen. And because we don't expect it to happen, we're going to reject the null hypothesis because we always assume the null hypothesis is true. So therefore, because we just saw something that's unusual within our data, then we're going to reject the null hypothesis because you told me that this is what I should see. You told me that what I should see is everything in blue, but what I'm seeing is out here in black. So I'm seeing something different than what you originally told me. So therefore I'm going to reject you, okay? The p-value is a probability. So anytime we ask you for p-values, you should never give me a p-value greater than one or less than zero because it's a probability. Now, it's the probability that if I were to repeat my sample, like for example, if I had a sample of 100 people and like the aliens question and I wanted to get another sample, if I do get another sample, I should get the same answer that I got with the null hypothesis or a more extreme answer, okay? So whenever I have small p-values and we're pretty specific as to how small, we say if it's less than alpha, Standard alpha at 5%. Otherwise, uh, if it's not given to you in the problem, then you use 5%. If the p-value is less than alpha, we're gonna reject the null hypothesis. Anytime we reject the null hypothesis, that means that we have sufficient evidence to support the alternative hypothesis. But if that p-value is greater than or equal to alpha, we will not reject the null hypothesis or fail to reject, you hear me say. And if I don't reject the null hypothesis, that means that what I just saw in my data, that didn't tell me anything. That didn't tell me anything that I, not, that I didn't already expect because again, we always assume the null hypothesis is true. So therefore my data, is insufficient 
or insignificant. I have insufficient evidence to support the alternative hypothesis. Okay. Right? Whenever you are doing or conducting a hypothesis test for proportions, you will use a one prop Z test. All right, so I'll walk you through that. Go through your four steps. You always wanna check your conditions, state your hypothesis, figure out what your you know, significance level is when you're checking your conditions, always figure that significance level out. Do your computations, use your one prop uh, Z test, and then answer those questions. Are you gonna reject your null or not reject it? And then what does that mean in context of the problem? Do you have enough evidence to support or not support your alternative? All right, so let's go through one of those. Oh, you're saying I'm not sure how I mute it out. So let's try that again. All right. All right. So Leroy, a starting player for a major college basketball team, made only 40% of his free throws last season. During the summer, he worked on developing a softer shot in the hope of improving his free throw accuracy. First eight games of the season, Leroy made 25 of 40. Is there enough evidence to suggest that Leroy's work in the summer resulted in a higher proportion? So in other words, is it higher than it was before? It was 40%, is it higher now? We're gonna test this at a 1% significance level. So that's your alpha at 1%. All right, so again, I'm not going to check conditions for the sake of time, I come, all right, yes, yeah, I gotta get through chapter nine, but the conditions have been met. You can, we can get you the PowerPoint later and you can go through to make sure you know how to check your conditions. All right, but the hypotheses would be, this is a proportions question because it's either you made the free throw or you didn't, right? And if I can tell you, well, it's 25 out of 40, that's another red flag that this is proportions or another hint rather. So my hypothesis would say, well, the P is equal to the 40% because that's what it was. And so we're saying it's still the same as what it was. That's the null, the status quo. It's still the same. It's neutral, always an equal sign. The alternative is your research question, which is saying we believe it's higher. So we believe that the proportion is greater than the 40%. Right, remembering alpha is at 1%. So now I go to my calculator. So I'm going to go to a one prop Z test. So let's switch over. And I'll rewrite that hypothesis for you. So one prop Z test, stat test number five. So your hypothesis. All right, so the point four is your P naught. Okay, so that's always the null value. That's the value that you were told. So we were told it was point four. Okay. Something's over my calculator, it's frozen. All right. And then X is the number of successes. So remember in the problem, it said that Leroy. Uh, he shot it 25 times. He made it 25 times, I'm sorry, out of 40 times. So 25 baskets out of 40. And then this is where we have to choose a correct test. This should always follow our alternative hypothesis. So since it says greater than, we want to make sure that we highlight greater than our P naught, which is the 40%. Press enter on that and calculate. So here is that test statistic that I talked about earlier. You can use that formula or you can just do your um, hypothesis test and let it give you your test statistic. I prefer this way because it just doesn't take as much time to calculate. And then here's your p-value. It says p, it's not your population proportion, it's your p-value. Remember your 
proportion is here. I'm trying to determine that. All right. So my p value, remember that our alpha was at 1%. So that's 0 0.01. Well, that p value is less than my alpha, it's less than 1%. So because it's less than 1%, we're going to reject the null hypothesis. So what does that mean? That means that we have enough evidence, sufficient evidence to support the alternative hypothesis, which says that Leroy's percentage has increased. It is better than 40%. It's greater than that. Now we have enough, well, we have enough evidence to support that. Remember, that doesn't mean we can prove anything to be true, but we just have enough evidence to support that he's gotten a little better. All right, any questions on hypothesis testing for proportions? What'd you, what'd you plug in for N? I'm sorry. For N? Yeah, it was a, it's not N 40. is your sample size. Uh, N is, it, yeah, it's, it's right here. N is 40. Okay, all right, I was just checking. Mm -hmm. Back to the, uh, let me show you what the, yeah, he made 25 out of 40 attempt. So we had a sample size of 40. All right. All right. What's next? Type one, type two errors. All right. So a type one error is rejecting the null hypothesis when it's actually true. So you made a mistake. The type two error says that you did not reject the null hypothesis, but the alternative was true. So you believe the null was true, but the alternative was true, right? The probability of a type one error is alpha, okay? Remember alpha is the probability that I reject the null when it was actually true. So it's the probability of a type one error. All right, so I know a lot of you did my, if you're in my class, you did that assignment that I gave you for extra credit on that. It's pretty cool. I'm still grading those, give me some time. I got about four more classes to go. I finished three of you already. All right, last module. Let's see, hopefully I have enough time to make it through. All right, should be good. I should be able to get you out of here in 17 minutes. What do you need to know for module nine? Module nine is really a, a, a redo of chapter seven and eight, but we're just, instead of proportions, everything is for means. So you wanna be able to do everything that we just did, but for means. All right, so accuracy and precision. Um, I'm not gonna go back over the accuracy and precision, but I'm just gonna update our, um, our symbols. Instead of mu of p hat, now accuracy is mu of x bar is equal to mu. The average of all of my sample means when I do my sampling distribution should be the same as my population mean. Remember that that means that my sample mean is unbiased, perfectly accurate. All right. Your standard error is calculated using this formula and its symbol is sigma of X bar. So as we talked about before, as your sample size increases, your standard error decreases, which means your sample mean is more precise. All right, everything else still applies. Your central limit theorem for means is a little bit different. Condition one and three are exactly the same, but condition two is the difference. With proportions, remember you have yes and no's, successes and failures. You need at least 10 of them. 10 successes, 10 people say yes, 10 people say no. But with means, it's not a success or failure type question. A means question deals with a numerical variable. So for example, the survey question would say, what's your height? What's your age? Um, you know, how many calories did you eat today? You would have to provide a numerical value. So when that happens, it's a means question. So the central limit theorem condition two, the large sample test for means is a either or. For proportions, it's an and. You had to have 10 successes and 10 failures. But for means, make sure you understand that it's an or. Either we tell you that your population distribution is normal or your sample size needs to be at least 25. Okay. One or the other. 
Now, all of the distributions that you've been taught, the population distribution, that's a distribution of everything, everyone that you're interested in studying. So if that, let's say if, if we're interested in all stat students, then the, the mean of that distribution would be mu. Okay. The um, standard deviation of that distribution oops, would be sigma, population standard deviation. The shape could be anything. Shape of the distribution, it can be skew, normal, whatever. Now the distribution of the sample, remember a sample is a subset of the population. So the distribution of a sample, the mean of it would be X bar. Sample mean, <clears throat> excuse me. The standard deviation would be S, sample standard deviation. The shape should resemble the population. So let's just say if the population had a right skew shape, then the shape of my distribution of the sample should also be about right skew. Because again, remember that your statistics always estimate your parameters. So X bar estimates your mu and S estimates your sigma. So those values should be close and therefore the shapes should be close as well. But the sampling distribution on the other hand, remember as long as those conditions have been met, then mu of X bar is the mean of that sampling distribution. So don't forget when you get a sampling distribution, you're taking a bunch of samples. This one is just one sample. This one is many samples, as many as you can possibly take. So the mean of that would be mu of X bar because remember one sample has a mean of X bar. So if I take a bunch of them, then I'm averaging all of those X bars, hence mu of X bar. The standard deviation is now standard error. The shape is normal. So it doesn't matter what that population distribution looks like. It can be any shape it wants. Once we convert from a population distribution to a sampling distribution, the shape changes to normal, as long as those conditions have been met. Not only does the shape become normal, but the standard deviation is smaller. This number is smaller than sigma. Now remember that these are practically the same. We'll say they're approximately the same. Mu of X bar is the same. It's, it's not close to, it is the same as mu. But standard error is smaller than sigma. And why is that? Look at your formula. You have to take sigma and divide it to find standard error of the mean. Okay, so know how these relate because I'm, you're going to get problems where I'm telling you all about a population distribution. And if it's skewed, how are you going to solve it? You got to convert it to a sampling distribution so that we could convert it to normal and calculate probabilities. All right, now. The normal distribution is only used when you're dealing with means when you're calculating probabilities. It's always used for proportions. But once you switch to a, a hypothesis test or a confidence interval for means only, then your distribution is no longer normal. Your distribution will now follow the t-distribution. The t-distribution has a t-statistic, not a z-statistic. If it's normal, the statistic, the test statistic is Z. If it's a T distribution, the test statistic is T, okay? And the difference is, is right here. That's why it converts to a T because Sigma is unknown. And so with a Z, you have to know Sigma. But since Sigma is typically unknown, then I don't know it. I have to replace it with this estimator and when I do that, I no longer have a z-score, I have a t, okay? So when we have a t-statistic, because sigma is unknown, we follow a t-distribution. Again, this is only for hypothesis tests and confidence intervals for means. 
sampling distribution of needs. All right, so here I show you the relationship between your normal distribution, which is solid, and your T distributions. Your T distribution follows a degree of freedom. That's this parameter. The degree of freedom is your sample size minus one. All right, so as you can see here, this one has a degree of freedom of two. So in other words, there were three people in that sample. This one has a degree of freedom of nine, 10 people in the sample, and this one is normal. So as you can see, some of you wanna be able to identify similarities and differences between them. As we increase our sample size, do you notice that the T distribution gets closer to the normal distribution? Do you notice that in the center of your distribution, you have more data in the center for the normal distribution, less in the, in the T? Why is that? Because if you look at the tails of the T distribution, that data is being pushed out from the center into the tails, okay? So those are some of the similarities and differences between the two that you wanna understand, All right? Now, if you're calculating confidence intervals for means, if you're gonna do it by hand, I give you the steps here. Um, of course, you know your margin of error is gonna be your statistic, X bar, because it's means, plus or minus your margin of error, but your margin of error has a little formula of its own. It's the critical value of T times standard error. Well, standard error has a formula of its own and it's the estimated standard error. So that complete formula all together will look like this. Okay. Now, how do we calculate the critical value of T? Remember, we calculated the critical value of Z by using the inverse norm one plus C divided by two. Well, the, you, for a T, you gotta do inverse T. One plus C divided by two, but behind it, you must include the degree of freedom. Now, if you have a TI-83, you do not have that function. You will need to use the T table that we provide for you. Okay. Your steps on the calculator, you wanna use a T interval on your calculator. So again, this is by hand. If you're having to calculate the margin of error or calculate stance, you know, those things. But if you're not being required to calculate all the pieces, then just go to the T interval, all right? So let me give you one example of that, one example of hypothesis test. And we made it, we, we made it out on time, I think. <laughs> all right, random sample of 60 12th grade students was asked how long it took to get to school. Sample mean is 16.1. So that sample mean, that's X bar. Sample standard deviation was 12.6, that's S. Find the 95% confidence interval for the population mean it takes 12th grader to get to school. All right, so I'm gonna go into a T interval. So I'll, I'll give you guys that information. what it says. All right, so that's the important information we're going to, oh gosh, I just wrote all over myself. Uh, it's not gonna let me move it. All right, I'll just have to rewrite it. One second, let's see. Let's see, 16.1, 12.6, okay. All right, so I'm doing a T interval. So stat, test, T interval is number eight. It says, do you have the data? No, I didn't give you any data, but I did give you statistics. X bar and S, those are statistics. So what is your X bar? So just enter in what the problem gave you for that as well as standard deviation. Oh, sample size, I forgot to get sample size. All right, it says we had a sample of 60. Confidence level at 95% and calculate, All right? So we would say that we are 95% confident that what we were talking about, <laughs> how long it took for them to get to school. Yes, we're 95% confident that um, 
12th grade students take, and I'll just say between 12.8 and 19.4 minutes to get to school. Again, if you notice when I'm doing the interpretation, it's about the population. Remember, you always make inferences about the population, not the sample. Okay, so again, we're 95% confident that the average time it takes for 12th grade students to get to school is between 12.8 and 19.4 minutes. All right, any questions on confidence intervals for means? All right, last thing, hypothesis tests for means. So for the hypothesis test, I want you to use a t-test. Okay, so let's do an example. Now, this is exactly what you're going to have to do and go through, as I said, with proportions on your test. It's going to be like five or six different steps to answering this one question. Make sure that you follow the instructions in on my stat lab. A lot of you are missing questions, your answers, because you're not rounding how the, the question tells you to round. Do not convert your answer to a percentage unless it tells you to. If it says to the nearest tenth, that means decimal. If it says to the nearest tenth of a percent, now you convert it to a percent and round it to the nearest tenth. Pay attention. As I was telling my classes today, if you do not, then this is what's going to happen on the final exam. Remember how it starts, you know, the questions, you, you, you have your question right. And if you're in my class, I allow you to email me that so I can correct your, the questions that the computer said you got wrong, but they were really right. So you plugged in 2.8, but the computer told you to run it to the nearest hundredth. So it should have been 2.79, for example. Well, final exam, you won't have access to. So therefore you won't be able to tell me that the computer marked you wrong for questions that you, you got right, but you just, in, you didn't enter it in correctly. So you have to be mindful of those things because I would hate for you to be losing out on points for something that, you know, you didn't have to. So be careful about that because um, I can't go through everybody's test. I have 10 classes, so I can't go through everybody's test to make sure that you know those answers are correct. So I need you guys to be very careful on entering your answers, okay? All right, last question. U.S. Department of Health has suggested that a healthy total cholesterol measurement should be 200 milligrams per deciliter or less. Records from 50 randomly and independently selected people from a study conducted by the agency showed the results in the technology. I did not give y'all the technology. Gosh, I'm sorry. I forgot to, to get that information. All right, I'm going to mix them up. Test the hypothesis that the mean cholesterol level is more than 200 using a significance level of 5%. All right, so let's see. I may have everything that I need, and we can just do it. We can do it in a calculator. Uh, your cholesterol should be 200. That's what we're told. We have records from 50 people. That's our sample size. We're testing the hypothesis that the cholesterol is more than 200. So that's our research hypothesis. So the null would say that it's 200. Whoops, not P. That's a means question. And we know it's means because we're checking cholesterol levels, right? So the mean would be 200. And we are looking to see, is it greater than 200? All right. So yeah, I did need to have some more information for you. And I, if you will give me one second, let me go. There's a piece of this question that I forgot to copy over. Um, when I, did, I put this question on right at the last minute, right before you guys came. And so I just, I need to go and grab that. So one second. Oh, no, I won't let me get out of here. Let me stop sharing. All right. Uh, 
could shut down on me. So I'll just make something up so that we can just answer this question quickly since it is our time. Let me pull it back up. All right, so let's just, um, I'm adding this information in. Let's just assume that um, our X bar is, let's say 210 with a standard deviation of, I'll just say eight. Um, so let's check that hypothesis. So mu is two, let me rewrite that in. We're interested in, is it greater than 200 now? All right, so alpha we said is at 5%. We already said we're con assuming conditions have been met. So we're gonna go to a t-test and let's see what it says. And let me forget the numbers I just made up, 210 and eight. All right, so 210 and eight. So we're t-test, stat, test, All right, so we have statistics, not data in this problem. Our mu naught would be the 200. And then I said 210 and a standard deviation of eight. And we had 50 people in the study and we are interested in greater, was greater than, right? Yeah, I believe greater than, than the 200 and enter. All right, oh, this is a good one because this is one that students keep calling me about. All right, there's your test statistic, there's your T, and you see that it is far, far away from zero. Um, so that means it is extremely unusual. So that lets us know we can reject the null hypothesis. But the other one I want to highlight, your p-value. Now, you know your p-value can't be greater than one. You got to be careful here because this number is in scientific notation. So if you see a p-value which is greater than one, you need to look at the end because that is not the right answer. This answer is about zero because this is telling you to move your decimal 12 places to the left, okay? So since my p-value is approximately zero, that's less than my alpha, sorry, less than alpha, which means I'm rejecting the null, which means I have sufficient evidence to support that it had, that your cholesterol level was greater than 200. All right. First of all, I have a question about that one. Um, Cause it was, it was asking that in the homeworks and it kept saying like, like when I was putting it in, the sample was correct, but that means you do like uh, 0. 0.000 and however many is negative from that uh, alpha, correct? Because sometimes it was like 0.1, but then it was like marking it wrong. I'm like, huh? It was kind of confusing, but I would put in like neck, like say how that was negative zero, I mean, negative 12, mm -hmm. I would do like 0 0.00 12 times and then it will make it correct because- um, Right, the, that's, that's, yeah, that's in standard notation. So you have okay. to move that decimal 12 places to the left. Okay, so that makes that answer practically zero. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. All righty. So that's our time. I hope you all, I hope this was helpful and I wish you all the very best on um, your upcoming test. Right. Um,